Good afternoon, welcome. Just another five more minutes for me to finish invoicing at line. So you find a cup of coffee. <laughs> you, you just now at five o'clock. Okay, we are here. Good afternoon. This is very evening already. Are you all here? Are we all good? 
thumbs up. Somebody on the chat box, tell us if you are okay. I had a long day, but I'm here. great stuff so you're able to hear me and not long Damir is going to unmute and declare the session officially on so if you need to fasten your safety belt please go ahead fasten your safety belt I can see Liz here already ah the bell has rang that means we should just move right along so we are moving right along well welcome and we should have with us people from the morning session. We couldn't do the morning session. We were in court full of excitement, but we are here. And um, we have done a brief background of professional conduct in the previous session. And today we'll look at paralegal practice communication skills so just take it through the module what it covers and if we don't finish doing that introduction we can finish it in the next session and then um, we're budgeting the one session to do information communications technology and then once that is done we will then move into a full schedule that will follow a timetable that will be very clear to say to you today you're doing this module you do that module the next day you're doing this module you do that module and it will also introduce interactive sessions i've seen kotato with your assessment material they're finalizing it there should be formative assessments and summative assessments so as soon as those are ready, they'll load for you on eLeader. The formative assessment will do them with you and try and assist you along. The, the formatives, the summatives, you will need to do them on your own because they consider the test. And we'll take it from there. If there's any group work, we'll let you know. During activity days, we'll then do the, the group work. Having said that, we are looking at paralegal Communication skills. I'll move through the guide. You'll see that at least from this page that this study guide is more about your interaction with clients or your interaction with customers whichever way they would put but most of the instances you'll hear the word client but it's also your interaction with members of the public who would want to get advice guidance and information from you if you work for government you also have people coming into the office or at the front desk to inquire about something and when you interact with these people the communication skills expected of you would follow what we'll do in this module you realize then that in as much as at outcome one, we are looking at you interviewing the client. And interview is not about the job interview. It's generally think of it as a fact finding communication. So a person walks in and they, they, they want to find information. And we'll look at that when we go through the study guide just now. The second thing, we look at sources of information in order to assist the client with inquiry. Again, at this stage, it is nothing heavy. We are not saying um, go and find case law, go and find sophisticated research. We are simply saying in this situation, you have assisted a client and the client says, well, I have a, a bail application to be done for my brother and he is in this and this police station right now. And then say, okay, let's find out who's the nearest attorney who can actually assist you. 
you excuse yourself and then you go and, and get somebody to assist. Sometimes it's not just giving information and going to find somebody to assist. Sometimes actually finding information, like if a client walks in and wants to complete his road accident fund forms or he's completed them, he just needs a question on this or that. And you'll probably contact the attorney and say, there is this question by that client, how then do we fix this situation? Or you even call the road accident fund and see if you can get them help. Learning outcomes three, communicate information to the client in order to assist with the inquiry in a paralegal context. The, you will find that most of these learner guides, they will use words like in a paralegal context. The idea is running away from the idea that when you communicate with clients, we want to say to you that you do not consult with clients. You assist the clients, quote unquote, you are preparing them to meet an attorney if it is a litigious situation. If it's a non-litigious situation, you're simply assisting them perhaps to complete forms and all of that, and the forms will be lodged and, and, and that, but you are not finding yourself advising clients on legal matters that may end up in court. If you're going to be doing it, you want the support of an illegal practitioner, your first part of call, you always hear me say the attorney, but with the new Legal Practice Act, you might work for an advocate who is a trust advocate, and this trust advocate will then receive a client and will talk and have this discussion with a client. And while you are there, you want to make sure that the client is giving information that is relevant when to meet the advocate and how to work with the advocate, what information to bring and, and all of that. And it brings us to the fourth point, of course, can you see it leads you to a referral. You then have to refer that client to a legal practitioner in the sense of the Legal Practice Act. It's a practicing attorney, um, a practicing advocate, you should also be aware that a candidate attorney is a legal practitioner to an extent that they are assisted by their principal. The same with the pupil in extent that they are also assisted by the principal. But if they would consult with a client, you would then have the confidence that that consultation, if you're sitting with them, it will still end up with a principal, which is the actual practicing attorney. When you are making the communications, you are taking notes and all those details, have an expectation that at some point, the attorney might call you and the candidate attorney to come and clarify certain facts. And you will then move over, you look at study unit two. At study unit one, it looks more like customer service, of course already, but at this point, the, the point that we are trying to drive at and what we are trying to get you to do is to say, they will be at line in front of you. And when there is a client of, in front of you, what is expected of you and what you should do, you will see that what we will discuss will be more administrative. Tavan, if you're not going to mute that uh, microphone, somebody's going to pass by and say, hey, Tavan, how are you? And the next thing you know, uh, we hear the whole conversation yeah. from your side. So is that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Tavak. Well, you can see that at number one, I'm just trying to get you to meet a client. Like you just hit me and Tavang interact. So there'll be those interactions. How do you interact with a client when you meet the client? So you move now to the second part. In as much as you interact with a client in part one. In part two, how do you do it courteously? That is when they're saying you're doing it to improve customer service. Customer service has always been branded as the customer is always right. No, the customer is not always right. But 
even if the customer is not right, how you handle the customer, you ought to handle the customer in a courteous manner. And I'm avoiding to use the word professional because professional, yeah, but how do you define it? Courtesy, yes, it means you'll be kind. You will not scream at customers. You'd accept that they're upset. You treat them with care. Even if they are wrong at times, that's courtesy. Once we have discussed customer service and we'll discuss customer service, you will hear me have a discussion with you on customer service, not really as a lawyer, but I'll probably have a discussion with you on, on customer service as a marketing professional. And I will have the discussion with you to say, how does customer service affect the business in the long run? There's a saying in marketing which says that a customer is the lifeblood of a business. If a customer is not happy with the service, the customer is likely to replicate that unhappiness. And maybe next time when we meet, I will show you a, a picture of a saying you do when you do sales management. It will say, remember that you see one customer belly to belly, which means in front of you, and you can see them with a big stomach, that picture looks like. But that customer will see 10 people belly to belly, meaning if you treat one person bad, they're likely to tell the other 10 people. And the other 10 people are likely to tell the other 10 people that's 100. When we got admitted, the one thing that stood with me and the old judge, and he says to us, there's one profession where you don't need to do advertising and all of that. It is law because in law, your reputation is your marketing instrument. And customers, they will follow this through word of mouth. So when people interact with you in a law firm, in your own paralegal practice and whatever space, rest assured they'll talk to someone and somebody will call you and say, hey, I am from Orange Farm. And you're thinking, yes, like, so this person lives in a farm where there's full of oranges. Say, no, from Joburg. And you're in Pretoria. Say, but how did you know me? Don't worry. Somebody said I must call you and you are going to help me. I'll come wherever you are. So you have those scenarios where people call you from some obscure place and they're looking for you to help them. So in those situations, when these people travel all the way from Orange Farm, from Bloemfontein, from Kakamas, and they arrive in your office in Johannesburg or in Durban, and you are grumpy, you're not nice to people, you don't greet people, you don't smile, you don't shake hands. And they go and say, I've traveled all this way, I've slept in the bus to see these guys and they didn't treat me well. But they didn't meet the actual attorney, they met you, the paralegal, first face of the business. And this is what we're going to discuss in, in customer care. So we'll move right along, look at office support, Um, in my office, we'll call it housekeeping. Probably say, make sure that everything is in order. Make sure that files are placed in terms of their matters. All civil cases must go under the civil cases cabinet. And all criminal cases go there. But when they arrive at the civil case cabinet, they must be in alphabetic order. They will also be ordered in terms of matter by color. If there's one big client, they would have their own special color. Like you know, my office would got a green for his particular client. That client, their files are just too many. Therefore, they enjoy the color green. And the other day, Stan Dewey is sitting here. She's the one pressing away, making the pressing noise next to me on her computer. Then she says, remember, the color for road accident fund is red. So she has red for rough. So we thought it arrived, you know, but then again, that's how the whole thing works. There will always be a color for certain files in your office. Please don't mix the files with the wrong colors. Because 
It doesn't matter when you do it. It matters when you have to go to court and find that file. Or that client rocks up in the office and you are now looking for that file. Shoo. If you are somewhere close to what I'm talking about, you know what I mean. Files are always available, but finding them is another story. So they have to be organized in a particular way. So that is why you need to learn your office support functions. Be more like a librarian and archive your files properly. So you see, you must have a system and you should also, the next module we are going to communicate, we are going to discuss information com communication technology, but this business system as in computer system, like you would use app for legal, you would use my case, you would use all any other fancy computer system that you can make sure that your law firm works on that would discuss when we discuss technology but there's also a system how does the law firm function for in case for example in our case every friday we'll be doing consultations therefore if you're going to book us for an appointment you'll have to make sure that the appointment fridays and you also look at the type of clients and the type of issues they want to raise and if we have got any other day, we'll do it for you on a Tuesday, but we won't book you an appointment on a Monday. So on a Monday, we generally do our housekeeping. We look at files, which file we're doing last week, which file is urgent, which file is not urgent, which file needs to move where, who do we brief, where do we file. We'll probably do this for a good three hours on a Monday and whatever comes in in between goes there unless if there is court and we try as much as possible not to book court days on Monday, but Fridays you don't have a choice. Sometimes if it's unopposed Pretoria, we'll do it on a Friday or a Thursday. Now you also look at um, how to implement, how to do, I've just skipped two, how to do the research and develop plans for establishment and improvement of administration systems. You need to be on the learning edge, always learn what other people are doing, research what happens, talk to colleagues when you're standing on a queue in court, hear what other people are doing. If people are from bigger law firms as well, they are from, talk to them and say, guys, how do you do it there in Verkmans? How do you do it there in what, what? They'll tell you what systems they use. Sometimes are expensive systems, but say, okay, fine, but how do you do it manually? They'll tell you, but we've got a filing cabinet. This is how we do it. You can then adapt it into a smaller law firm. Of course, you will not use the bigger filing system they use, but you at least get to pick certain things they do and you look at their files, how they nicely put in the court dates. When is the matter supposed to return to court? You will see they would have nicely put the whole thing on, on, you know, on the cover of a file. You learn and learn the systems, research from other people, attend classes, and this is free. This is me doing marketing for LSSA. Check if they've got um, those short courses for a thousand rand, a thousand five for office administration. And attend those courses if you can. Ask your, your your boss or somebody, your principal, to assist you to pay for those. It's usually cheap for staff members who come from law firms. Attend those. If it's in person, the better. Go and attend, meet people, mingle, and hear what other people are doing in their law firms and copy best practice. So having done that, you also will look at, once you've learned these systems, learn to implement them properly. Systems don't work overnight. It takes time to implement a good administration system in a law firm. We're going to look at how you implement it, and I'll, I'm going to coach you into patience. If a system is frustrating, it's probably a good system. Once you get it, then everything runs smoothly. Learning outcome for provide monitoring, control, and evaluation of administration systems. You see, we do it on Mondays, like I said to you. Have you picked a day? Pick a day in a week and say, on this day, we will check every file and make sure that it's there. And at least there's a fingerprint from somebody in the office. Somebody has touched this as well. Otherwise, you would have files that go stale and the client comes six months down the line and say, how far is my case? And the 
that's when you're in trouble. Make sure that you attend to these files. Study unit four, office admin and litigation. Affirmation that we don't do a date on Monday in court unless if we don't have a choice. We don't do a date on Friday in court unless we really don't have a choice. Like if you are unopposed divorce matters and regional courts, so put them on a Friday. If we are going on trial, we would choose a Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, Thursday, if possible, and avoid Fridays. And we do Friday at a premium, really, if we don't have a choice. So that is what we are going to discuss under that. So you're going to explain the need for negotiation skills as well while you are at it. You need to negotiate with colleagues. You need to negotiate with uh, the clerks at court, for example, you go there and they say to you, well, the dates are full, but we have a date on a Friday and next to Tuesday, but we're not sure about Tuesday. You negotiate away for the Tuesday. So you negotiate with clients as well. And for example, on divorce matters where the only date available is on a client's birthday. Who wants to get divorced on their birthday? And then you need to negotiate and say, sister, brother, here's a problem. If we don't do the date now, we'll get another one in six months time. So you might as well, every time you have a birthday, celebrate twice. So you would have to look at those kind of negotiations and be nice about it and be courteous and make sure that they, the client understands and they don't take it too much personal and they're able to, to agree with you. There are many other negotiations you have to go through. Explain the steps in the negotiation processes. Sometimes you're not only negotiating with clients, you're not only negotiating with colleagues, you're negotiating for your client with the opponent. And in your paralegal context, you are likely to find yourself in those negotiations. For example, if you have to deal with situation of the tribal council, Amakosi and all those other people, and you see if you can negotiate this or that for a client, the dates, the settlement, the, all those things. If it's negotiation, for example, for divorce settlement, business settlements, you likely will sit with an attorney who does the negotiation. Besides that, you would have to, at times, be able to bring the instruments that can assist parties to negotiate. Like, what is an offer from your client? And if you've never conversed the offer with your client, the attorney will not be able to make the offer. So you need to know that negotiations have got offers, they've got counter offers, they've got deal breakers. When we reach this point here and no more. Uh, just on the chat box to help us move along now that we are talking negotiations. Can we negotiate those of you who are working with attorneys, can we negotiate whether what percentage of the pension fund can a spouse have? To bring you very quick at it, the pension fund would have to give the other spouse 50%. It's, but is, can we negotiate? Can we say, okay, sh we are going to give you, in, in Pretoria would actually say, Okay, sharp. You are going to have twenty percent. Wabo, can that be done? Yo, you need the image. I had that situation. It's a non-negotiable situation. It's statutory. The the act says this is what's going to happen get 50%, they get 50% and that's it. Um, if we don't agree, I can simply go to court and say, well, we pray for the endorsement of the pension fund. No stories, they'll give 50%. Of course, you will negotiate, you need that way you, you're talking about um, less than say your half share of the house. And you can then use the pension fund to pay for your half share of the house and you buy the house from the other person. Yeah, that you can do. 
but whether they get half of the money, non-negotiable. They get half of it. So if the pension fund is 5 million, they get the whole 2.5 and then they go to I blew it. So that's going to happen. And it's one of those negotiations you need to know that they exist. If it's road accident fund lines, now that I'm talking, I blew it. There's a moral obligation for you guys to actually coach, advise, and help the clients not to blow it. I think the same should apply with, with divorce matters. But what we found with divorce matters is that half share usually goes to buying the portion of the house, especially if it's a lady. Um, women would prefer, most of the ones I've done, they'll buy half share of the house. They want to stay with the children in the house and all of that. Guys don't want to buy GDI and drive into the sunset. So you find yourself into those situations. Seed an advice, if, if, especially if it's a younger couple. Seed an advice. You can only advise. And what happens thereafter is totally up to them, but you would have now advised them what to do and what not to do. You see, that's where negotiation comes in. You should have good negotiation skills. You should learn the strategy you can use for negotiation. So this brings you to what the curriculum in this module will entail and generally speaking what are the things we're going to discuss i'm going to go through at least the first portion of the module like we did with the other ones but just in the chat box tell us what kind of administration software do you guys use at work do, do you have some we use app for legal. What do you use? Do you do you have any app you use? I guess somebody uses LexPro, NetDocs, Law24. You see, there are different options. So while people are, are typing legal suit, copy and paste if you don't have one at work and say, hey boss, here's a cup of coffee come register and use ghost practice. Of course, the, the prices are different. They will, they will depend on what how big the law firm you work in. And also if you've got a your own private practice, the worst thing that you will even try to do is to try run the whole law firm on Excel. No, guys, please don't try this at home. It doesn't work. You need some sort of one of those they've listed there or even another, just find a software that can help you to do manage the practice easy. Correction law 74, somebody says they use law 74, not law 24. Okay, so those are the applications that we use at work. And at some point when we do the, the discussions, oh, we'll go through these and then you will tell me what are the advantages of using these and what are the disadvantages of using this? Those who use ghost practice, was it easy for you to learn how to use this thing? And what was the most difficult thing to learn about it? Or the easiest thing about it? Not even the, the most difficult. If it was difficult, somebody says, no, yes, it was very easy to use. So it's relatively easy to use, right? Okay. So I'm going to move us into... I'm, I'm not going to read you all of this. This is what you need to learn and know at the end of the module. We've done this whole thing with the other modules. This is way too long for the one module, so I won't take your time. You only put an hour to do this. So I'll move you right into study unit one so that you can see what you need to learn in study unit one. In study unit one, you need to interview the client to determine the nature of the inquiry within South African uh, legal framework, source information in order to assist the client with the inquiry, communicate information to the client in order to assist with the inquiry in a paralegal context, refer the client in terms of that inquiry that the client has made. So, interview the client to determine the nature of the inquiry. So, let's see what needs to happen here. 
first, they say you need to apply the following things. Interviewing techniques, which we'll look at. You need to learn language skills. You need to learn languages. Languages will require that you get translation. At times, you don't need to translate into another language. Sometimes you need to understand the context of what is being said. You need to get the level of language skills. When you were looking at, I don't know if you look at this, um, if you follow the Sense of Miwa trial and it was said when the admission was made, the suspect was of intellectual skills which were elementary and the attorney asked what is elementary and the investigator said well elementary is according to him the skills to read and write but below grade 12. so it means that a person can read and a person can write but they cannot always comprehend concepts above a certain level we were with another old man and he says you know when i was still young i used to write my reports in africans and i would write them very well because i could see he signs documents perfectly it's just that now he shakes a bit he's old it's no it's not part of my time I, I used to do this thing and i would write reports in africans and and my employers would say to me i went to school but let me tell you Mr. Pala, I've never been to school. You see, you're going to have people who have got language skills. They even have got literacy skills and have never been to school. So when you work with them, be cautious not to take it too far and say, well, they can read, they can write, they understand, not always. Another thing we said was listening skills because we are in class, I'm doing all the talking too much and you, are learning the skill. You're sitting on the other side, you're listening to me. And exactly six o'clock, Lee will, 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 will put the hammer down and say, hey, 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 let's all go home. But all that is being done here is when you talk to a client, ask questions and listen. There's a difference between listening and hearing. Ask a question and hear the client you hear what you want to hear. Ask the question and listen to the client. You would hear what they want to tell you. Therefore, you've been listening. So at times, words do not tell the story. Sometimes it's not in the it's in the it's just not in the in the words. Sometimes it's in the tone of voice, sometimes in the pitch, sometimes it's even in the silence. Interviewing techniques. You need to learn certain things when you're going to interview people. So you need to walk into a room. I don't know about COVID, but you need to shake hands old school, as we used to say, or do the COVID handshake you learned when the president was doing the family meetings but greet people and when you after you greet the person introduce yourself and you say my name is Pala, mr Pala." you know do it like you do in the movie say my name is bond james you get the drift bond so You've never looked at that introduction going, hi, my name is Bond, James Bond. No, it's bold. Like my name is Bond, James Bond. And you will, you will always remember the name Bond. So when you introduce yourself, be very clear about it and pronounce it easy. And if you are... Um, Murekudiviana, 
when somebody cannot pronounce Morekudibiana, please don't be offended. I've I've seen I've seen um candidate attorneys, paralegals, and somebody mentions their name wrong, and then then this no, that's not my name. That's what my name is. Yeah, I hear you, but you know, you're not you are not going to interact with this client once. With time, you are both going to learn each other's names and how to pronounce them properly. But also, if you are not Sotu, Zulu, Gosa, take time and learn people's names, especially the popular same names in your area. It will not help your situation if you cannot say Zuma and you are from KZN. Learn, pronounce, talk to people, talk to colleagues, pronounce their names properly. Don't settle into a space where you cannot pronounce people's names and you think it's okay. People take offense. While I'm saying don't be offended when somebody tells your name wrong, because remember you are the professional here. You are, uh, um, shall we say you are the adult here? <laughs> you are the professional here in the room and you are the one who's supposed to take the punches, but don't expect the client to allow you to butcher their name. It's not going to work. And take time, practice, talk to colleagues and let them assist you in pronouncing their names properly. Ask the person why or oh, she has come for help. Well, for me to help you to understand this, I should use cues. So one of the cues we should help you, do you still remember the old FNB advert? It had a catchphrase. Somebody unmute yourself and tell us what was the catchphrase? How can we help you? Yes, FNB, how can we help you? So if you don't remember how to do this, do pull an F and B on a line. Say, hi, welcome. My name is Nolutando. And say, how can we help you? And wait for an answer. And they'll be able to give you an answer and you can take it from there. But Ask this question, don't ask it and you continue writing and you do other things. Ask the question, look at the client, expect an answer and let them see you expecting an answer. Sometimes people find it very difficult to talk about their problems to strangers, try to establish how willing or able the client is the client to discuss the issue. If, for example, you're in a law firm, you're going to interact with different people. Um, rape suspects, for example, uh, race, uh, rape suspects even, rape victims. But in most instances, you will deal with suspects themselves. And he walks in and or she walks in or, and, and, and you have to discuss a difficult topic. If they're a victim and they're a lady and you're a gentleman, please find a lady in the office. If you're a lady and there's a gentleman coming, please find a gentleman in the office to assist. We, we discussed this principle when we were discussing with investigators. That we say to investigators, always find the opposite gender to assist you with the situation. And of course, we say to investigators, do not hand tissues because the tissue you handed would still be evidence at the later stage. And then the investigators will laugh about it. But just be cautious how you do things and how you handle things. Be patient with the client and be willing to listen to them when they speak. Try to ask questions which will assist the client in telling you about their problems and be a good listener. And sometimes some clients just keep on talking. You also want to interject. When you interject something like, well, I arrived there, ne? and then eh, there was noise. Boom, 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 boom. And then eh, I looked to the left, I looked to the right. Yo, I didn't see anything. Remember, 
Then the story goes, 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 then now you hear that we are not getting to a point. You bring it a little bit back and say, okay, sir, after the boom, 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 was there anything specific that caught your attention? So you're moving the discussion into a particular direction, but you are picking on a word or a phrase they used so that it will help you to move things right along. Try to ask questions which will assist the client in telling you what they need to say. Do not hurry to a conclusion about what you think the problem is. Well, since you're a paralegal, you are not like leaving a principal, but you do have attorneys you work with. When you're a candidate attorney, you have principal. When you go into your first consultation, or probably your first five consultations, your principal says to you, we are going to consult with the client or with the advocate. Please, when we arrive there, do not say anything. And then you say, ah, we are both. He doesn't want me to say my own opinion. My friend, your opinion doesn't matter. Please don't say anything. When the situation is bad, don't go, chu, 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 ha, ha, ha. Keep a poker face and listen to the conversation and take the notes. Answer when asked and then be very brave. Don't raise your hand and say, can I say something? I've got my own suggestion here. Please don't suggest anything. Start warning you. Just sit here next to me. Not to say anything. You see, she's been quiet. It's been quite the message, anything. No, Lutad, you want to say something? No. Yeah, don't say anything. <laughs> so, so that's during your consultation, the Lutad. You'll be expected to keep quiet. And your heart is going boom, boom, boom. I, I have to get this off my chest. No, keep it in your chest. Ask the client what steps he or she is she took to try and solve the problem before coming to see you. This is important. Um, for example, if you are dealing with cases that have got to do with the community schemes of any ombudsman, actually, the community schemes ombudsman, the banking ombudsman, all these ombudsman, yeah, they say in the applications, has your client or have you tried to resolve the matter with the bank before you come to report it with the ombudsman? If you don't ask your client this question, you will not be able to reply to this question in the application form of the ombudsman, for example. It's important. Discuss with the client what steps are necessary to solve the problem. Sometimes we think we've got the solution, you know. We say, yeah, this is what's going to happen. But sometimes if you listen, the client will resolve the problem. I had a client, well, she was working with this big company and we go to the CCMA and we, we have the matter resolved and we cross-examine the, 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 the CEO, I, I believe something like that. And, and here was, we really need to do this. And she says, yes, Mr. Paul, you must ask this question that we ask away and all of this. But when we are done with this person, she, comes outside and say, Mr. Pal, I think I'm fine. My 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 heart, my heart is is settled. I said, hey, were we here to settle hearts or were we settle, here to, to win a matter? He says, no, but I think right now I'm willing to take a settlement because I've taken off what is was in my chest. Hey, mind you, I was the one who was doing all the talking asking all the questions. So I was very happy that, well, I could at least ask the questions that make her settle the issue. But you see, sometimes it's not what you think. And she was actually winning. Sometimes it's not what you think. People have got different reasons why they do their things. All you can do is to advise. And she says, no, I am the right way to, let's let this thing go. And that was that. The thing was let gone. Sometimes, the client needs advice, 
and they need counseling and they don't want to create world war. Well, language skills. In the chat box, what new language are you study? Are, are you learning right now? Me, I'm perfecting French, mon ami. It's a compliqué. And I'm all, I also want to learn Spanish. South African ones, I speak all plus two zita. You, which one do you want to learn? Learn Africans, Moita. Oh, you must, you must learn to learn that. Yeah, learn is also, it's good. Start with the greetings and, and, and the basic things. It helps to have friends. For, for me, French worked because I spent a lot of time with guys from Cameroon. And they would speak a lot of French, especially when they're angry. Then I would ask, hey, what was the fight about? They saw what they fight, they go, jamais, mon frère, jamais. No, 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 never, my friend, never. Yo, we didn't learn that would be nice to learn Shona. Yes, you also learn sign language. <laughs> that would be very cool. So you need to learn these languages. Learn. Be armed with history for whatever twelve. Well, I also speak pigeon. The pigeon, it's it's um, it's 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 more like your Toti Dal, but speaking in 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 West Africa. They use English and they add French to it. You probably hear people from Nigeria, from Cameroon, and and people from um, from Ghana. They use it. So when they say I'm going to visit my girlfriend, they say, "I do go visit my Ghana now. I do see you later now." So it's that language. It's called Pigeon English. So you learn the languages. The best way to do it is to interact with people as they speak. Anyway. Uh, I did talk to you now the language which you they use now in the classroom. The language you use should be English, but then learn the other languages as well. South Africa has 11 official languages. Not all people are fluent in these languages, hey? But find a region. If you're in KZN, then Zulu. If you learn Zulu, the bonus points is you would understand Tosa and Isiswati to an extent. Learn Sotho, you'd understand Northern Sotho, you understand Southern Sotho. It, it, it will only be a problem where you want to say, I want bread, and you talk to a Tswana person, you're using Southern Sotho, it, it's a different thing. The Southern Sotho person will not give you the Motswana person will not give you bread, they'll give you pap. Well, there are small things, but generally the rest of the stories go the same. And there's a Pretoria language, it's, a, it's another language, Yagada. When communicating to clients in writing, always use the client's home language if you can. If you can't, use English. The, the legal, environment and i think i think this was this was done by um who was the previous chief justice they did pass a directive and say all communication in courts should be in english so you are very likely to hear communication in english And you're likely to receive correspondence in English. What happens when you receive correspondence in Africans? And if you are doing postgraduate and, and things like that, if you're going to refer to old cases and some of the theses which were written at UP and 
Stellenbosch, they will be in Afrikaans. Hey, my friend, there's Google Translate for that. Copy the thing, put it in Google Translate. It's very likely to bring you to the right language. If it gets you lost along the way, ah, sorry, but it will get you there. Use a translator. Generally, Google Translate or find any other thing that can assist if it's text. If it's people, get somebody who can translate. Pray at all, ne? So if, well, there is a situation. So we, we went into court and we, we arrived. They found the Afrikaans translator. The Afrikaans translator was required because the investigator was Afrikaans. He wrote everything. He wrote affidavits and everything in English. And we are getting along with this. And he says, I need an interpreter. We say, but why? You've been communicating with us in English all along. And even your affidavit says, no, guys. Your English ne, is way above my English. That's where my English starts and ends and Africans begin, gentlemen. Then we get an African interpreter. The African interpreter comes in and says, yo, I get The English used in this court is beyond my level of Africans. So you understand how we went shopping for an African interpreter? So that's not easy. And if you want to go into interpretation, you must go into English Africans interpretation. This is a skill. It's very difficult to get a proper interpreter. Level of language. It is important that your clients, you understand that your clients communicate at different levels and never presume that your client knows anything about the law. This thing about clients, they tend to you know, in the olden days, somebody will cough, they wouldn't Google what cough syrup to use. But these days, they cough, they Google, and for some reason, they end up with our cophilix and a higher dosage. <laughs> so so they, 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 get, they cream or somewhere a very strong dope of alcoholics and, if possible, of Johnny Walker to cure the flu. Same. Now they take that whole situation into law. Somebody comes to you and say, yeah, and I've Googled a case, you know, and, and I'm thinking this case applies to my situation. You no. Don't use Google for law. It's a bad idea. So that's time we're here. It's terrible. Don't use ChatGPT. Please don't. Just don't, you'll thank me later. <laughs> that is ChatGPT. It never works. Explain the law. They say in the movies, explain to me as if I was a four-year-old. So if you're going to use the language that you're going to explain a legal principle to a client, explain this as if your client was a four-year-old, not in the condescending manner, but in the simplicity of speech. It must be so simple for the client to get it. Always explain how law affects the client's problem. That is called application of the law to facts. You always get this when you write a legal opinion. So for you to get application of law to facts, read judgments. You see judgments, they start with facts, and then they analyze the facts. They go to the applicable legislation. They go to applicable case law, and then they apply, and then there's an order. So to read judgments, don't start with the big ones. Don't go reading Makonyane and, and the and recertification judgments. They're too big. Find something small. Find a three-page, five-page judgments and read those at least once a week or find CCMA once. Read, read judgments at least once a week. I read judgments at least once every night. So find one a week. It helps. As far as possible, avoid the following using difficult language don't try to impress the client with jargon right it doesn't work words like substantive prescription the, the client will say now what does that mean like uh, we were having a consultation here with the colleagues earlier then we said to the client well that clause in the contract does not apply in perpetuity the client says ah eh? 
in what? Who didn't play in English? So you're going to find yourself in those situations. Avoid Latin words. Say, well, what what has occurred at an issue? No, just simply say what has occurred from the beginning. Or if you're from Eastern Cape, say what has occurred from the Ningi being something of a sort. But it must be from the beginning. Or in Ningi B. Using jargon. Avoid jargon, my friends. Um, the best communicator is the one that uses plain language. They say you want to see good court papers drafted. They should be in plain language. So if you take notes, plain language. Listening skills. Be attentive. This is very interesting. You see, in your book, and I'm reaching, looking at the time, we've got four minutes, but in your book, I'll borrow five minutes from you. I'll pay it back some other time. In, in your book, they say, use eye contact. But do you know that in some cultures, eye contact is considered disrespectful? Especially when you are young and you're looking at an elder and you look at them in the eyes, they think it's disrespectful. So learn the cultures. It's very important. Nod your head, not violently, but kindly. Say yes. This is how you know a person is a South African. You can meet them where? Okay, not Australia. Australia is South Africa. South Australia doesn't count. You can meet them somewhere in Europe, in Zurich. And you talk to that person. Someone in the unmute yourself and tell us what will the person say for you to know that they are South African. Tineke, what will they say? Hello, Mr. Polo. Who is it? My Joma. You see, and then they say, yeah. All South Africans, you guys like saying, yeah, yeah. And then they don't just say, yeah, they they, they agree and they disagree at the same time. They go, yeah, niem. yeah, no. Those are South Africans, <laughs> no matter where they are in the planet. You can you can get into a plane and somebody speaks, yeah, no, man. Hey, hey, hey. You know this person is a South African. They will say, yeah, no, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. That person is a South African. It doesn't matter. All South Africans do this this whole story. I don't know how, but that's us. And then, of course, they'll say, sure, who's it? South Africans. Let your clients tell. So when you're doing consultations, you must also say, yeah, yeah, man. Oh, ah, yeah, no. Hey, 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 South Africans. Let the client tell the whole story. Show the client that you are sympathetic about his uh, problems. Do not be impatient with the client. Just listen. Well, I will not go into this whole detail. Like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll try this in two days. So then the next time we meet, we will discuss this. You will see at least here that I've put for you a very simplistic client intake form. Find something like this at work and create one. It helps. I've I've tried I've called who are these people I was talking to, I'll tell you now. Is B L S A A Black Lawyers Association or something. I wanted to do some course there. The first three minutes or whatever of the call, the person goes. Um, may I ask your name? You give them the name and they want to spell it out and say name and your 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 contact number. And there I'm going, no, can we get to the parish line? I said, what am I looking for? So if you're going to get the details of a line, please don't waste the whole time trying to do it. You can also get them in between the conversation. 
Good morning, sir. You have reached the office of Shukushuguma Attorneys. How may I help you today? I, I need to get your consultation about a matter of my business. And your name, sir? Mr. Sipongkuna. Okay, Mr. Nguna, in case we get cut off, what's your telephone number? Then leave it at that. Don't say, okay, Mr. Nguna, what's your date of birth? Ah, no, yeah. Uh -uh. Get off that bus already. It's not going to work. So, but somewhere along the line, you, Mr. Nguna will say, yeah, I've also tried to submit and, and I've sent them my ID number there. The office, okay, what's your ID number? The moment they send you ID, the ID number, you don't have to ask them the date of birth because it's on the ID number. Unless they give you a passport number. Age, you don't have to ask. You can use a calculator. It's easy. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your chance to ask questions for the next three minutes. Now that we've, we've exhausted your five minutes. In these three minutes, you can ask a question in a chat box. You, you can unmute yourself and ask. Please go up with it. Um, hi, Mr. Pella. I'm so sorry, man. I might be out of um tune, but I just wanted to ask quickly. <coughs> um, at which stage are we supposed to secure um practical training? When you have, okay, I'm going to show you something very academic. So you need to train on a principle called a 30-70 or a 70-30. So 30-70 means you attend your classes 30% of the time and you should be in practice 70% of the time. So people who are working, like who are attending now in the evenings, um, you can see that your class is just about an hour, right? So it says you doing more of 30% learning and 70% work experience. And you'll hear me talk to you about what you do at work. But those who attend in the morning, they'll do most of their 70% in class and 30% at a law firm. When we reach that stage, I will inform you and say, guys, does any of you need assistance with obtaining practicals at a law firm? That could be anything between three to four months. I'll let you know. We'll arrange with you with Merlin and then we'll start that process. Right now, let's get the things right. And then when we are ready, I'll let you know. Well, does that solve the problem? Thank you so much, Mr. Pala. Yes. Ah, Petulo. Now you are sending me out. How the hell are you? <laughs> so, so Petulo, we'll, we'll have to find you at a law firm. I, in the absence of any, uh, Mina, you'll have to come and help me carry them back to the court. Anybody else with any other question? Hi, Mr. Pala. Ah, you know. And hi, everybody. Off the topic, Mr. Pala. Yes, cool. Um, there's something that I watched over the weekend. Yes. Um, basically, it's the channel talking about the people who were convicted and served the sentences, but they actually did not commit the crime. Later mm. in life, after serving quite a few years, mm. it was um, found out that they were actually convicted because of circumstantial evidence, something like that. But then the other victims, or not, I mean, not the victims, um, the people who were actually helping them. They found out, okay, let me, let me be specific. There was one guy who was accused of rape mm. um, by a certain lady, um, and he was convicted. 12 years later, it was found out that the lady lied because she was paid. You know, you know this thing of growing up in Makaya. Yeah. You know, people will actually have jealous that Umtuanada's bandanban is studying and 
life is continuing. So they was they were jealous because of that. So years later, the lady confessed that actually this guy didn't do anything. I was paid by whoever to lie about him after spending 12 years in jail. So eventually the guy was released. So my question now is why the law is not actually punishing the lady who lied? Why is he, she just being let go just like that? Well, first thing first is that there is, it's unfortunate, but there's recourse for people like that. They actually sue the state for unlawful arrest and then and malicious prosecution and things like that. Then they become multimillionaires while they are at it. But hey, can money ever buy time? That's a painful thing. The lady, of course, somebody can open a charge of uh, perjury, lying under oath, it is a criminal offence. And the question then becomes, does the NPA follow up with this? But if the gentleman lays a charge, it will be done. But interestingly, remember criminal matters, prescription is 20 years. So this happened 20 years ago. It's not very likely that the charge will stick, but it's happened seven years ago. Yes, it will. And that depends on the gentleman. But in most cases, you find that people go for compensation, sue the state, and at some point they also sue the other person. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Fagner. Uh, going once, going twice. Gugu, it's on you. Do we close the class or not? Yes, Mr. Pala, you can close the class. Everybody Ladies and gentlemen, tea and coffee. this matter is officially done. Thank you very much. See you next time. Thanks, Mr. P. Have a good one. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you.